Peace and love to the family. Welcome to the Darius Corbin Mystery School, the home of the esoteric and the metaphysical knowledge. It's always a pleasure. Every time I turn this camera on, it's always a pleasure. Every time you see me behind this camera, know you're about to get that gnosis, that knowledge, that esoteric, the hidden knowledge, the metaphysical, the spiritual science of it all. Tonight, the presentation is called The Revealer versus the Redeemer. The Revealer versus the Redeemer. Now, to my church folks, I want you to sit back and think about the word Redeemer. Redeemed. They tell you in your church you have been redeemed. A couple videos back, we talked about us as humans, especially the ones in church, having the Redeemer complex. In church, they teach you how to be dependent on Jesus, how to be dependent on God. But most importantly, God's Son, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. But how many of us out there have ever been introduced to the Revealer? Mmm, you will be introduced this evening. This presentation, as I do with all of them, are going to have some head scratching. Going to have you go into your preacher like, Pastor, what is this? Explain this. Because we're in the age of Aquarius, and I don't care how many times I say this, I'm not going to stop until you understand what this means. 2,000 years ago, my folks, we were in the Piscean age. 2,000 years ago, we were in the Piscean age. If you don't know anything about astrology, it's time for you to get familiar, family. 2,000 years later, here we are in the age of Aquarius, where it's no longer about religion. Do you understand? Where it's no longer about the mythological character Jesus. Do you understand? 2,000 years later, it's not even about religion. You have left the age of the Redeemer. You have left the age of needing somebody to redeem you. We are in the age of Aquarius, where you are now being introduced to the Revealer. Mm, mm, mm. Welcome to the Darius Corbin Mystery School. If you haven't already, please grab a pen and grab paper. It's about to get serious. We are still on this book, Not in His Image, by John Lamb Lash, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the Future of Belief. If you have been watching my channel, thank you for watching, you know that uh, Gnostics are my ancestors. The Gnostics are my ancestors, but most importantly, they are the early Christians. The Orthodox churches have hid, have destroyed hundreds of years ago have killed majority of the Gnostics because of the true divine message they had of the Christ. You and a lot of people like you out there who go church, you are introduced to Jesus Christ. You see how they put the words together? Jesus Christ? Hmm. What I am doing is letting you understand more about the Christ and how it was more Jesus the Christ. You are the Christ. The mythological story of that man that you went to church was to tell you that you are your own redeemer. You don't have to look outside of yourself to know who you are. You don't need nothing in no Bible to teach you what nature has already taught you while you being human. You don't need nothing outside to teach you what Mother Nature is already showing you on this planet. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You do not need nothing or no entity from that Bible, from a church, telling you something naturally you already have inside of you 
to love your neighbor. This is something naturally you know how to do. Are you ready? The revealer versus the redeemer. Pen and pad ready. The deep starling impact of the Nag Hammadi material becomes evident with the codexes, and that's spelled C-D-I-C-E-S, with salient anti-Christian elements such as the Second Treaty of the Great Self are composed to the Salvationist doctrines common to Judaism and Christianity, whose larval form is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm going to read that again. The deep, startling impact of the Nag Hammadi material, and for y'all who have watched my channel, you sh we should already be well familiar with the Nag Hammadi, which was discovered in 1945, which goes against everything they taught you in church. The true work, the non-canonical gospels. Are we clear on that? Before I continue, listen up. The deep, startling impact of the Nag Hammadi material becomes evident with a codexes with salient anti-Christian elements such as the Second Treaty of the Great Self are composed to the Salvationist doctrines common to Judaism and Christianity, whose larval form is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as explained in Part 1. Once its key feathers are detected, the Gnostic protest against Judo-Christian redemptive religion stands out more and more clearly as an informant motif of the entire corpus. I'm going to stop there. For my church folks out there, you guys know Adam and Eve. And you know the kids they had, right? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Well, they had a third son. And this is why I tell you the reason why I go so hard about why in 2022, y'all are still in church regurgitating regurgitating, throw up, put it back in. These pastors are not teaching you nothing new. They're not informing you on your gnosis and they're not bringing you closer to the Christ. That is an issue. That is a problem. That's why me and so many people like me are here now. You, they knew we were coming at this age of Aquarius. You think we're going to stop now because y'all want to go harder and blinding the people? Mm -mm. Let me ask you this question for my people watching. You have heard about Cain and Abel. Well, you're going to know more about Seth today, their other son. So I want you to write down the second treaty of the great Seth. The second treaty, and I spell T-R-E-A-T-I-S-E. Of the great self. Because after this video is done, I want you to sit back and I want you to read the second great treaty of self. And you're going to get a little bit in a few. I'm not here to play games. Family, it is time for you to awaken. They have took your power. You have been sitting in church regurgitating the same old stories. Noah, Job, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham. You won't go past that. Even when you know about Enoch, you won't go further in Enoch. Why? Because it's, it's talking about watchers, aliens. That's why I did the previous video. Because I got some more stuff straight from this book that's going to have y'all scratching your heads yet again. But I'm going to bring it back to the, to the Bible because we never leave it. Sometimes I just want to stop with these presentations and really see if you guys are understanding this. Because we're in 2022 and yet here we are. People still are blind to the fact. Hmm. The deep starlink impact of the Nag Hammadi material becomes evident when the codexes with salient anti-Christian elements such as the Second Treaty of the Great Self are compared to the Salvationist doctrines common to Judaism and Christianity, whose larval form is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as explained in Part 1. 
Once its key feelers are detected, the Gnostic protest against Judo-Christianity redemptive religion stands out more and more, clearly as an informing motif of the entire corpus. Repeated reading research and comparative studies bring out the true grain of the radical pagan argument of, and I quote, the children of Seth. As the highest initiates of Gnosis called themselves. Did you know that, church folks? The children of Seth, S-E-T-H, as the highest initiates of Gnosis called themselves. Uh-oh. Highest initiates. So what you telling me? I'm, I, I didn't get all the, the good stuff that was... Nope. Listen. Seth is almost entirely excluded from the Old Testament after a brief mention in Genesis 4.25. And I quote, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Eleven minutes in, and I promise you I won't stop here. I'm going to read that again. I got time today. Let's read that again. Seth, who was the third son of Adam and Eve, the brother of Cain and Abel. Listen to what it says. Seth is almost entirely excluded from the Old Testament after a brief mention in Genesis 425. Family, we have a whole issue here. You've been reading the Old Testament and the New Testament back and forth your whole life. Have you really delved deep into who Seth was? Or did you just on Sundays and on Bible study days sit back and let your pastor and your bishop regurgitate the same old stuff and make it sound good with dances and good songs because we know the songs are good and these stories about how you need to get your life together and always comparing their life to how ratchet it used to be and how now they are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Did you do study on stuff? I, I, I doubt it. I really doubt it. Because after we find out who self is, I want you to do your research. And after you do your research, family, I'm going to need you to go to your pastors and your bishops. This is the age of Aquarius. Stop playing with your spirituality. And yes, I'm going to read it one more time. Self is almost entirely, I said almost and entirely in the same sentence, guys. Seth is almost entirely excluded from the Old Testament after a brief mention in Genesis 4.25. And if you have your Bible, you can pull it out now. And I quote, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Quote, end quote. Gnostics believe they belong to, and I quote, another seed, i.e. a spiritual lineage stemming from primal humanity. God, I hope you guys are listening out here. I hope you are listening. Let's read that again. Gnostics, my ancestors, your ancestors, they believed that the other seed, that the another seed, i.e. a spiritual lineage stemming from primal humanity or anthropos. And that's A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-S, which is pretty much another name for the primordial human that we were before we were cast down into this earth. Once again, that's a n t H R O P O S, Anthropos. Distant from Judo Christian sacred tradition. Let me read that in this whole. 
Gnostics believed they belonged to, and I quote, another seed, i.e., a spiritual lineage stemming from primal humanity, Anthropos, distant from Judo-Christian sacred tradition. Their argument against that tradition might be epitomized in a line from the second treaty of the great self, where the Gnostic teacher protests against, and I quote, the plain which they devised, excuse me, the plan which they devised about me to release upon the world their error and their senselessness. The teacher who speaks here would have would have been regarded as foster, a light bearer or revealer. You guys have no idea, and I know you watch the videos. I love each and every one of you. You got to understand how much this upsets me. As a divine messenger of Christ, and you get your, you know, trust me, everybody, you, you're not going to be able to save everybody because everybody doesn't want to be saved. But if you're going to watch my channel, just do your research. I don't care if you're a, pre uh, a, a preacher, a bishop, any type of theologian. If you're a part of a congregation every Sunday that goes in here, you just sit back and you let the preacher tell you what you want to hear without doing your research. Then you wonder why you go through this stuff, depression, schizophrenic, bipolarism. Because you won't do your research. This upsets me. I'm going to read that again. The Gnostics' argument against their tradition, which is Judo-Christian, might be epitomized in a line from the second treaty of the great self, which you're going to be reading and studying after you watch this presentation, aren't you? Yes, you are. Where the Gnostic teacher protests against, and I quote, the plan which they devised about me to release upon the world their error and their senselessness. And guess what in 2022? Guess what they accomplished? Not the Gnostics, the one you go church and listen to. Guess what they accomplished? Their error and their senselessness. Let's continue reading. The teacher who speaks here would have been regarded as a foster. P-H-O-S-T-E-R. What does that mean? A light bearer, and I quote, a light bearer or revealer. Now, this is the part that kind of gets me But my church people, what is Satan, what is Satan Lucifer known as in the Bible? To my church people, even in that same Bible, what does Jesus Christ reference himself to? I wish I had some Jeopardy music, but since I don't, Get your cards ready. In the Bible, what is Lucifer also called? Also in that same Bible, what does Jesus claim himself to be? If you said light bearer, you are right. Lucifer, the light bearer, or the son of the morning. In that same Bible, Jesus referenced himself to the light bearer. So now you're starting to understand more about the redeemer versus the revealer. You always been taught to love and be obedient to the redeemer and his so-called father, God. But once you read the Nag Hammadi, which was discovered in 1945, but guess what? It wasn't printed in English till 1977. It wasn't printed in English trans translation until, uh, until, excuse me, 1977. So discovered in 1945, 
wasn't printed in English translation until 1977. So you already know your big mom, mom, and pop pop, and even some of you by that time already had the canonical gospels, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you weren't privy to this. And they didn't want you to know this because if you knew it, you wouldn't be worried about a redeemer. You'd be focused on the revealer, like Seth, who the third son of Adam and Eve. Let's keep on going. Thank you. The teacher who speaks here would have been regarded as a foster. Once again, that's P-H-O-S-T-E-R. It also reminds me of a word. Phosphorus, and we'll maybe, if we have time, we'll go back to that word as well. A light bearer or revealer. This is a title for the illumined master in mysteries who preserves the sacred transmission of gnosis knowledge such as the gods enjoyed. What is a light bearer or revealer? This is a title for the illumined master in mysteries who preserved the sacred transmission of gnosis, knowledge such as the gods, plural, enjoyed. Let's keep on going. Foster is a close parallel to Buddha, and I quote the illumined or awakened one. In the tradition of the Levitine and Egyptian Gnostics, the revealers, enlightens, enlighteners, and some translations are not superhuman avatars, but super endowed human beings who possess extraordinary knowledge of natural and divine matters and who demonstrate paranormal facilities. They are comparable to the Vendaros, that's V-I-D-Y-A-D-H-A-R-A-S, and I quote knowledge holders, and Cedas, S-I-D-D-H-A-S. And now, of course, I may be pronouncing these wrong, but that's why I'm spelling them so you guys can look these words up yourself. Once again, that was the vend Venderos, which is knowledge holders. And the Cedas, S-I-D-D-H-A-S, which means, and I quote, the accomplished ones of Indian mysticism. And Mayana, which is spelled M-A-H-A-Y-A-N-A, -A -A, and Tibetan Buddhism. The Sanskrit Cedia is cognate with the Greek Adap from Adapsi, which is spelled A-D-E-P-S-C-I, and I quote, to be accomplished, trained Cedias or paranormal powers such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, and lucid dreaming. How many of you out there have had clairvoyance? Raise your hands. How many of you guys have clairaudience and lucid dreaming? I know I am a lucid dreamer. So now we have a whole problem here, guys. The churches you go to didn't break this down to you about the mysteries and the powers that the ancient one, your ancestors had, and the powers that you have, but you cannot really open that gate the way you want to because you are being brainwashed, not by the God you go to church uh, and worship, but also his archons, which if you watched uh, Racism Decoded, you were, I'm going to break it down who the archons was, and if you Watch that video and start reading this. You're going to realize more by the time the next video who the archons are. I'm going to read that again. Foster is a close parallel to Buddha, which means, and I quote, the illumined or awakened one. That's P-H-O-S-T-E-R. It's a close parallel to Buddha, which means the illumined or awakened one. In the tradition of the Levantine, which is spelled L-E-V-A-N-T-I-N-E, -E, and Egyptian Gnostics, the revealers, enlighteners, in some translations are not superhuman avatars, but super endowed human beings who possesses extraordinary knowledge of natural and divine matters and who demonstrate paranormal facilities. They are comparable to the Videros, which means knowledge holders, and the Sedeas, which means accomplished ones of Indian mysticism, and with the Greek Adap from Adapshi, which is spelled A-D-E-P-S-C-I, which means to be accomplished, trained. Sidious are paranormal powers. Now let me spell that because it sounds like Sidia, which I spelled a while ago, but
but this is spelled S-I-D-D-H-I-S. Cities are paranormal powers such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, and lucid dreaming. Let's keep on going. Let's recall that the Redeemer Complex, remember we talked about that, right, in the other videos. Let's recall that the Redeemer Complex, the core of the three Arabic religions, excuse me, the three Abrahamic religions, Abraham. Let's recall that the Redeemer Complex, the core of the three Abrahamic religions. What are the three Abrahamic religions? Christianity? I'll just go in order. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All core religions that come from Abraham. Let's read again. Let's recall that the Redeemer Complex, the core of the three Abrahamic religions, has four key components. Creation of the world by the Father God. You should be writing these down. I'm going to read it again, so I want to make sure you're writing this down. Because you are masters in training anyway. A master is always going to be a student because there's always more to learn. So let's read that again. Let's recall that the Redeemer Complex, the core of the three Abrahamic religions, has four key components. You have pen and pad ready? Number one, creation of the world by the Father God, independent of a goddess. Uh-oh. Don't let me go in with that because I will, but let's read that again. Number one, creation of the world by the Father God independent of a goddess. The selection, number two, the selection and testing of the righteousness, few or chosen people. Let's read that again. The selection and testing of the righteous few or I quote chosen people. Number three, the mission of the Messiah sent by the Father God to save the world. And four, the final judgment delivered by Father and Son upon humanity. These are the four key components of Abrahamic religion. A good part of the truly original material in the Egyptian codexes is dedicated to refuting these components. Y'all talk about ancestors and going back to the knowledge, the knowledge and the gnosis. Did you hear what I just said? Let's read that again. A good part of the truly original material in the Egyptian codexes, C-O-D-I-C-E-S, is dedicated to refuting, that means go against, arguing against, is dedicated to refuting these components and ridiculing the beliefs attached to them. The OGs of ancient Gnosis and Gnostics were laughing at y'all. Christianity. For, for example, number one, creation of the world by the Father God independent of a goddess. It was like, how? Don't you know that the first religion was the worship of the goddess? And now Abraham, here you come talking about the woman is this, the woman is that. The goddess is evil. The goddess is wicked. A good part of the truly original material in the Egyptian codexes is dedicated to refuting these components and ridiculing the beliefs attached to them. Gnostics consider the divine plan, and I quote, listen to what my ancestors say. Gnostics consider the divine plan of salvationism, i.e. the manifestation of God's will in the course of historical events, to be a gross tease, a gross tease, distortion, of the genuine spiritual lineage they represented. In their view, the divine love of the Pleroma, which is our heaven, the true heaven, where we come from, with the source, the supreme father, and the supreme mother. In their view, the divine love of the Pleroma, the transcendent gods, come to expression in human revealers. The transcendent gods come to expression in human revealers who appear through the ages to teach and guide humanity. They poised or position an ongoing educational process for the enlightenment of humanity, a system of cultivating human potential and awakening the genius initiate to our species, but no plan of salvation of such. 
Scholars call the perennial transmission of gnosis by Illumin teachers the revealer cycle. The revealer who speaks in the second treaty of the great self warned that salvationism is a plan devised against the guardians of gnosis whose enemies, and I quote, release upon the world their error and their senselessness. When the Zediac ideology of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that's spelled Z-A-D-D-I-K-I-T-E. You need to write that down because Zedekite is who the modern day Christians, the Romans, the Greeks and all of them, they took this so-called Messiah from Persian. And that's how they came upon this Messiah figure. But once you read about Zedekite, and I spell Z-A-D-D-I-K-I-T-E, you will learn a little bit more. But let me go into the main focus. When the Zedekite ideology of the, sea, of the Dead Sea Scrolls exploded in a mass religious movement after 150 CE, teachers in the, in the mysteries disregarded their vow of anonymity and came out of uh, publicity to protest what they preserved a deceit and defiance in the salvationist belief system for Christianity to triumph. And adherents had not only to silence the Gnostics, but to destroy the Millennium Network of the Mysteries and eliminate all evidence that, had, that it had ever existed. Now let me read that again and make that make sense. Scholars call the perennial transmission of Gnosis by Illumin teachers the revealer cycle. The revealer who speaks in the second treaty of the great self warns that salvationism is a plan devised against the guardians of Gnosis. And Gnosis means wisdom. So the second treaty of the great self warned that salvationism is a plan divine against the guardians of wisdom. Whose enemies, and I quote, release upon the world the Dead Sea Scrolls exploded into a mass religious movement after 150 CE teach, teachers, excuse me, 150 CE. Teachers in the mysteries disregarded their vow of anonymity and came out publicly to protest what they perceived as deceit and defiance in the salvationist belief system. For Christianity to triumph, its adherents had not only to silence the Gnostics, but to destroy the Millennium Network of the Mysteries and eliminate all evidence that it had ever existed. So let me stop and get a breather and tell you what that means. That means the ones that destroyed and killed the Gnostics, not only did they destroy them, not only did they know that their work was divine, but they spent centuries, 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 and more centuries to make sure we, you, the people who go to church, never knew who the Gnostics were. Because if you knew who the Gnostics were, you would know your divine powers. And if you know your divine powers, you wouldn't need uh, the government or religion. Because now, by now, you should know that the religion and the government goes hand to hand to keep you mind programmed. Are you with me? In the perspective of time, the protest of the Gnostic revealers returned to haunt the human mind and perhaps awaken humankind to the source of its undoing. Gnostic scholar K.W. Troger estimates that one-third of the Coptic corpus is anti-Judaic. I reckon that anti-Judaic and anti-Christian elements combined, combined amount to nearly half of the material in NHC, which is short for the Nag Hammadi. Codexes. The second treaty is exemplary of the Gnostic protest against salvationism. It contains page after page of scathing attacks on Judaic and Christian beliefs and customs. It, ridicule, it ridicules the biblical forefathers and cascades those who follow patriotic religion, unable to see how it corrupts their very sense of humanity. We're 34 minutes in. I know the ones who sit back and listen to me even though it may be broken language sometimes, even though it may be I get over -excited, I think you know where I'm going with this now. And I can feel y'all when you're watching this, so I make it my duty because this information is important, so I make it my duty to make sure I'm clear as possible. So as long as you don't mind, I don't mind going back reading so I can make sure you get this information and you know how important this is. What they are saying is that the Gnostics who were the early Christians 
all the work that they had was anti-Judaic, anti-modern-day Orthodox Christianity. Not only did it go against y'all teachings, but they laughed at y'all Christians. How silly of you motherfuckers to think that this is the truth. Let me read that again. And if you feel sorry for the language, I'm sorry for you for feeling that way. You should be feeling sorry for the fact that they lied to you in your churches all these years. Let's continue going. Gnostic scholar K.W. Troger estimates that one-third of the Coptic corpus is anti-Judaic. Estimates that one-third of the Coptic corpus is anti-Judaic. I reckon that anti-Judaic and anti-Christian elements combined amount to nearly half of the material in the Nag Hammadi. The second treaty is exemplary of the Gnostic protest against salvationism. It contains page after page of scathing attacks on Judaic and Christian beliefs and customs. It ridicules the biblical forefathers, the one you go church and worship. It ridicules the biblical forefathers and castigates those who follow patriotic religion, unable to see how it corrupts their very sense of humanity. So before I read a page from the second treaty of, 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 of self, I want you to understand that my ancestors, <laughs> that my ancestors were laughing at you guys who follow this patriarchal religion. Y'all took the goddess out. Everything comes from the mother. And Abraham, that's why I said you guys are not ready for the Archon talk. I know you're not. Some of you are. But you are not ready to know who the Archons are. Yadabroth, or excuse me, Yahweh, was the Lord Archon. He chosen Abraham to be the one that chooses his worship. So when we start to go to Ezekiel 1 through 15 and talk about the wheel and the creatures on that ship, this gets deep in us. That's why I did racism decoded the galactic truth. And wait till I do the archons. Abraham was chosen for all the wrong reasons. Abraham put in the work to confuse your minds, to bring in this monotheistic religion, to take out the goddess energy, or try to take it out. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You've been hoodwinked. You've been led astray. You've been bam boozled and for that reason I'm going to read that again family hit the like button leave comments and I thank all the ones that do leave comments I'm going to have to do a tribute video just for y'all for the brave souls who ask questions for the brave souls who leave comments this is who I do this for the ones who knew that they were more special than what the pastor told you. Know that you were more spiritual. Know that you were empaths. Know that you were star seeds. Because you are. I'm bringing you proof if you ever needed it at this time. So I'm going to read that again. Gnostic scholar K.W. Troger estimates that one-third of the Coptic corpus is anti-Judaic. I reckon that anti-Judaic and anti-Christian elements combined amount to nearly half of the material in the NHC. The second treaty is exemplary of the Gnostic protest against salvationism. It contains page after page of scathing attacks on Judaic and Christian beliefs and customs. It ridicules the excuse me, but, but, but it ridicules the biblical forefathers. It ridicules the biblical forefathers and cascades, cuts those who follow patriarchal religion. You know, the belief in the father, there's only one father, there's nothing besides the one father. My woman, how, how dare you? You are the matriarchs of everything, even in the cosmos. You've been feeding this shit to us 
and yourself for years. It cascades. The Gnostics cascade those who follow patriarchal religion, unable to see how it corrupts their very sense of humanity. Now, are you ready to see what Seth said? Listen to this. And Adam was a laughing stock. And Abraham and Jacob and David and Solomon and the 12 prophets and Moses and John the Baptist. None of them knew me, the revealer, nor my brethren in the mysteries. They never knew truth, nor would they know it, for there is a great deception upon their soul. And they cannot ever find the mind of freedom in order to know themselves in true humanity. This is what Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, came from a spiritual lineage. You know, the Ad another seed, he was that another seed, different from both Cain and Abel. Let's read what he says once again. And Adam was a laughing stock. And Abraham and Jacob and David and Solomon and the 12 prophets and Moses and John the Baptist. None of them knew me, the revealer, nor my brethren in the mysteries. They never knew truth, nor would they know it, for there is a great deception upon their soul, and they cannot ever find the mind of freedom in order to know themselves in true humanity. Point by point, the second treaty attacks the core belief enshrined in the Redeemer complex. Point by point, the second treaty attacks the core belief enshrined in the Redeemer complex. And I quote, the doctrine of a dead man is what Seth says. The doctrine of a dead man. End quote. Centerpiece of Christian theology. Point by point, the second treaty attacks the core belief enshrined in the Redeemer complex, the doctrine of a dead man, the centerpiece of Christian theology. It sharply contrasts the salvationist Redeemer to the revealers who both model and teach the Anthropos the true identity of the human species. Gnostics saw in the Jewish Messiah the Sadakite, which is once again Z-A-D-D-I-K-I-T-E, the counterfeit revealer and a bogus model of humanity, his claim to exclusivity as the, and I quote, only begotten son of God was simply a lie intended to set up an authority that could not be challenged by mere mortals. God damn this shit, man. I'm not teaching the dummies. I'm not teaching to dummies. not teaching the dummies. I might do a part two. Maybe. Point by point, the second treaty of self, which you better be reading after this, attacks the core belief enshrined in the Redeemer complex, the doctrine of a dead man the centerpiece of Christian theology. It sharply contrasts the salvationist redeemer to the revealers who both model and teach the Anthropos the true identity of the human species. Gnostics saw in the Jewish Messiah the Zedekite figure that later morphed into the Christian redeemer, Jesus Christ, a counterfeit revealer, and a bogus model of humanity. Am I getting under your skin? I hope so. Let me read that again because it felt so good coming out. Gnostic saw in the Jewish Messiah the Zedekite figure that later morphed into the Christian Redeemer, Jesus Christ, a counterfeit revealer, and a bogus, so bogus, model of humanity. His claim to exclusively as his claim to exclusivity as the only begotten son of God 
was simply a lie intended to set up an authority that could not be challenged by mere mortals. In the, excuse me, in the tradition of the mysteries, revealers appear periodically through the ages to enlighten and teach. This is why I go so hard, because I am one of them, and you are too. Listen again. In the tradition of the mysteries, revealers appear periodically through the ages to enlighten and teach. They are completely human, unlike the eerie superhuman alien Melchizedek. Whoa. The power behind Christ. Did you hear that? They are completely human, unlike the eerie superhuman alien the uh, Melchizedek, the power behind Christ. Each revealer has realized the true identity of human species, but the unique status so claimed of the superhuman Jesus Christ does not generally reflect such a spiritual attainment for Gnostics. Only a genuine flesh and blood human being can guide and teach humanity. Let me read that again. Each revealer has realized the true identity of human species, but the unique status, so claimed, it says, of the superhuman Jesus Christ does not generally reflect such a spiritual attainment. For Gnostics, only a genuine flesh and blood human being can guide and teach humanity. And it reads, Theological Semtex, Semtex, S-E-M-T-E-X. Gnostics regarded the incarnation as a priestly fraud forced it on humanity. But not just that. They also considered, and I quote, the sin of God to be a delusional idea insinuated into the human mind by a species of aberrant non-human entities or mental parasites, the archons. The Gnostics, the early Christians, my ancestors, the ones that were killed, burned alive, all because they had the divine gnosis that they preserved for you to know that you are greater. With the help of Abraham and so many more, That lynch was damn near wiped out. But it was prophesied around this time, the age of Aquarius, that they would return and give the people on this planet their power back. So those who watch my channel, you got to understand, this means a lot to me. It does something to me. I'm doing my work. I'm about my mother's work. And a Supreme Father. This is my gift to you. As divine Christ. Listen to what I'm saying here. Because some of y'all don't want to hear the truth. And it gets scary. So I'm going to read that again. Gnostics regarded the incarnation as a priestly fraud. Forced it on humanity. But not just that. They also consider the Son of God to be a delusional idea insinuated into the human mind by a species of aberrant, and that's A-B-E-R-R-A-N-T, non-human entities or mental parasites, the archons. These bizarre intra-psychic phantoms are minions of the demiurge, the false creator God. Now, if you guys watch chapter 2, The Blind Samuel, you know what they're talking about. A concept that appears to be unique, that appears to be unique to Gnostic thought in their identification of the Demiurge with Jehovah, the Father God. You guys love Jehovah so much, huh? Jehovah. Let me read that again. Gnostics regard the incarnation as a priestly fraud forced it on humanity, but not just that. 
They also consider the Son of God to be a delusional idea insinuated into the human mind by a species of aberrant non-human entities or mental parasites, the Archons. These bizarre intra-psychic phantoms are millions of the Demiurge, the false creator god, a concept that appears to be unique to Gnostic thought, and their identification of the Demiurge with Jehovah, the father god of Jewish and Christian tradition. Gnostic drew a frontal attack from those who founded their religion on a cherished belief in the male supreme being. Often, the attack was violent and sometimes murderous, as in the death of Hypatia our ancient mother. Modern scholars cannot ignore the fact that the Gnostics consider the supreme being of Judeo-Christian religion to be a demented imposter, but they make as little as possible of this outrageous claim. Y'all churches don't tell you about the archons. They don't let you know that the Jehovah that you worship, Yahweh, is a demented archon, a non human entity that has played y'all for years. Emmanuel J-E-S-U-S Jesus It gets dark, but I'm going to bring you to the light as a light bearer. Modern scholars cannot ignore the fact that Gnostics considered modern scholars, listen, Modern scholars cannot ignore the fact that Gnostics consider the supreme being of Judeo-Christian religion to be a demented imposter, but they make as little as possible of this outrageous claim. In many scholarly, scholarly works, the nature and activity of the archons is simply passed over in silence. In many scholarly works, the nature and, and activity of the archons is simply passed over in silence. Your church never told you about the archons. So how is it fair that they teach you about Jehovah, Yahweh, but don't teach you about his goonies? These are the same goonies I told you a few videos that raped Eve. Once you read the Nag Hammadi and you go and Google on the origin of the world, which is a lost gospel, non-canonical gospel, you will realize that. You got the right one now, guys. The best, the two best known texts on Gnosticism, Hans Jonas, and I spell H-A-N-S Jonas, J-O-N-A-S apostrophe S, the Gnostic religion, you should be writing these books down. And Elaine Pagels, the Gnostic Gospels, do not include archons. Ain't that a bitch? So I want you to understand this as well. A lot of what we know from Gnostics were taught to us by the ops. A lot that has been taught to us about the Gnostics were the same ones who destroy, who try to destroy the legacy of them, damn near destroy the legacy of them. So it would be no different than, let me give you a good one. Scar, killing Mufasa, And then Scar telling you the story about Mufasa, knowing he has to tell the story, but leaving certain parts out. That's what they were doing, is what I'm saying. Are you with me now? The two best known texts, and listen to what it says. This is messed up. The two best known text, texts on Gnosticism, written by Hans Jonas and Elaine Pagels, the Gnostic religion and the Gnostic Gospels, don't even include the Archons. So some of you out there may be thinking you up on your Gnostics. Yeah, I know about the Gnostics. But they didn't even teach you about the Archons. Uh, and there are translated equivalents. So let me read that again in satiety. They do not include Archons and their translated equivalents, rulers and authorities. They're also known as the rulers and authorities in the index. Yet the scenario of the Demiurge and his weird minions figures strongly in the Sophia mythos, the creation myth taught in Levantine Mysteries. The Levantine Mysteries. Gnostics clearly associated the Archons with what they perceived to be the religious Demetia of Judea Christianity. But the notion of, and I quote, an alien implant, 
is so bizarre that scholars are loath to consider it. Dismissing the archonic material in the Nag Hammy gets the experts off the hook because it disobliges them from giving full and fair treatment to the Gnostic critique of salvationist religion. In short, it saves them from the risk of theological incorrectness. Deception and counterfeiting are signatures of the archons. Their delight is in deception and their counterfeit spirit. And it says, let me read that in full. Deception and counterfeiting, deception and counterfeiting are signatures of the archons. And I quote, their delight is in deception, which is called A-P-A-T-O-N, and their counterfeit A-N-T-I-M-I-M-O-N. Spirit. That's the prophecy of John. The Greek antipon denounced willful intent to deceive. And antiminion, which is spelled once again A N T I M I M O N, denounced the method of archonotic deception. Literally, it means counter mimicry. Counter mimicry, which means. This means to copy something but make the copy the fake version serve a purpose counter to the original thing or idea. And this is what the archons do. This means counter mimicry, which is spelled C O U N T E R M I M I C R. This means to copy something but to make the copy the fake version serve a purpose counter to the original or idea. A mRNA vaccine, for example, and this book goes in on the C-19 as well. I was shocked when I opened this book and it was going in on C-19 really hard. For example, in their view of human self-deception, a highly sophisticated view comparable to the noetic psychology of our time, Gnostics regard the divine redeemer as a counter mimic of their revealer. Pagan adapts from the mysteries in the Levant and Egypt saw in the salvation program of redemption both the evidence and the instrument of archonic deviation. They did not blame the archons for originating the program, however, but for colluding with those human beings who did. They did not blame the archons for originating the program, however, but for colluding or colliding with those, or colluding, I'm going to use that word, with the human beings who did. And let's read this. This is his, this is one of the Gnostics' uh, pages. Yadabrov himself chose a certain man named Abraham and made a covenant with him that if his seed would continue to serve him, he would give him, he would give to him the earth and as inheritance. Later through Moses, he brought forth from Egypt the descendants of Abraham, gave them the law, and made them Jews. From them, the seven gods, also called the Hebdomad, and that's H E B D O M A D, chose their own heralds to glorify each and proclaim, and proclaim Yadabroth as God, so that the rest of mankind hearing the glorification might also so serve those who proclaim by the prophets as God. Let me read that again. Yadabroff himself chose a certain man named Abraham and made a covenant with him that if his seed would continue to serve him, he would give to him the earth as an inheritance. Later through Moses, he brought forth from Egypt the descendants of Abraham, gave them the law, and made them Jews. From them, the seven gods, also called the Hebdomad, H-E-B-D-O-M-A-D, chose their own heralds to glorify each and proclaim Yadabroth as God, so that the rest of mankind hearing the glorification might also serve those who were proclaimed by the prophets as God. Here is the definite moment in the sacred history of the ancient Hebrews viewed with a rather unusual spin. The Gnostic warning is a split, or explicit, excuse me. The Gnostic warning is a split, it assigns a completely different value to what transpires between Abraham and the entity he takes for God the Father, Yadabroth, a made-up word possibly derived from Aramic, and I quote, who transverses the eternal space, is the Gnostic code name for the false creator God or Debiurge. His realm is the planetary system exclusive of the Earth, the habitomad of seven planets, 
In the cosmology of the Sophia mythos, Yodabroth and his minions arise as lifeless, distorted mirroring of the divine matters, excuse me, of the divine patterns of celestial archetypes in the Pleroma. So, Yadabroth, Jehovah, is the Lord Archon, and the rest of the Archons, since they cannot have any tent and can't make up, create anything their own self, they bootleg everything that comes from the Pleroma and the archetypes. They come, the divine archetypes that come from the Pleroma, the true heavens. So what I'm saying in clear form, and I probably might do it, I think I'm going to do a part two and I'm going to start where I left off. But that demiurge that you pray to in church is bootlegging everything that comes for the Pleroma. And you are stuck worshiping him until you get out your damn feelings and out your damn mind program and realize that that bootleg virgin is not the true father. Here is the definite moment in the sacred history of the ancient Hebrews viewed with a rational, unusual spin. The Gnostic warning is explicit. It assigns a completely different value to what transpires between Abraham and the entity he takes for God the Father, Yadabroth, a made-up word possibly derived from Aramic. And it quotes, who transverses the external space. It is the Gnostic code name for the false creator god or demiurge. His realm is the planetary system exclusive of the earth, the habitomad of seven planets. In the cosmology of Sophia mythos, Yadabroth and his minions arise as a lifeless, distorted mirroring of the divine patterns or celestial archetypes in the Pleroma, the Godhead. And I quote, and she established the ferment, Steroma, after the pattern of the realms that are above. For by starting from the invisible world, the visible, by starting from the invisible world, the visible world was created. Quote, end quote. They are called archons from Greek, archaea, A-R-C-H-A-I-A, -A, which means primal or first from the beginning. Because the formation of their world, the planetary system, subject to inorganic and mechanical laws, precedes the formation of the living earth. The Sophia mythos and the role of the archons are both fully elaborated below, beginning in chapter 10. In the Gnostic's perspective, the archons are not only mind parasites, delusional nods in the human mind considered as quasi autonomous psychic entities, if you will, they are cosmic imposters, parasites, posed as gods, but they lack the primary divine factor of Enonia, and that's E-N-N-O-I-A, which also means imagination, but also intentionality, creative will. They can't create. They don't have any tent. So can they just copy everything. So this earth that we're living in is really an illusion, but this earth is still ours in nature. They just put this goddamn veil over our eyes that keeps us and hides us from the true pleroma, from the true mother. Are you getting this? Because I'm going to stop and I'm going to do a whole reversion of this. But they lack the primary divine factor of intentionality and creative will. They cannot originate anything. They can only imitate and they must effacuate their copycat activity with superfluous uh, Subterfuge, and that's S-U-B-T-E-R-F-U-G-E, -E, and stealth. So they got to be real quiet about it. They got to be hidden about it. They can't put it in plain sight. Least is true nature be detected. So let me read that again. They cannot originate anything. They can only imitate, and they must efficientate their copycat activity with subterfuge and stealth. Least is true nature be detected. Be detected, excuse me. Hence, they offer Abraham something that already belongs to him as a member of the human race. The earth has already been given to humanity. It is the precious habitat the goddess Sophia dreamed for the Anthropos. 
which is the prime of human, in which she manifested by the metamorphosis of her own divine luminosity. The archives approached Adam with a fake deal, promising him, him possession and domination of terrestrial realm. But this is not compatible with Sophia's Enoya, her divine intention. The earth is not a territorial prize, but a precious setting where the human species can realize its innate genius, its, cap uh, its capacity for uh, novelty, acting with the natural boundaries set by the goddess. The archons mimic the divine Enonia, Sophia's intention, and at the same time they invert it in place of participation in the divine miracle of symbiotic and evolutionary emergence, which is the true birthright of humanity. They promise Abraham a fake sovereignty that works against that birthright and deviates human purpose from its proper course of unfoldment. This is counter mimicry in action. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to give you an hour and five minutes this time. Maybe in this case, hour six, seven. Leave comments. Hit the like button. It's this time that you realize that there's no such thing as Redeemer. Nobody's going to save you except yourself. They have put a wall over your eyes. You have been going to church praising this alien deity who has blindfolded you, took your true supernatural or true divine powers, I may well say, and gave you this slave mentality. But if you only knew how powerful you were, you will be destroying this religion altogether. Family, the time is now. I am the divine messenger of Christ. It's time for us to wake up. Until next time, the Davis Corey Mystery School class is in session.